It was the Christmas holiday of 2015. My grandparents on my dad's side were flying in to celebrate with us. I joined my folks for the drive down to the airport. The whole way there, I fantasized about what I'd get come Christmas morning. Toys no longer interested me much. I had been promised a mountain bike for my birthday, but it had never materialized. Maybe this coming holiday was my chance for a laptop or even a console. I was 14 that year, and things in my life were starting to change. I wasn't sure about anything anymore, to be honest. Most of my friends no longer had time for me, and I was starting to feel a little bit unwanted. The only times I felt normal was when I was out in nature or locked in my room playing video games. Even then, I knew that second one wasn't really healthy for me, but what was I going to do? I wanted to talk to my parents about it, but I didn't think they'd understand. Their time in school had been completely different. Both were involved in sports and very popular with their peers. My experience was the exact opposite. In my childlike thinking, I thought, how is the prom king going to understand what it's like for a nobody? My grandparents were already waiting at the curb when we arrived. Dad and I helped load their bags into the car. I was looking for any oddly shaped or strange objects, but nothing really stood out to me. The ride home was much like the ride there. I was lost in my thoughts most of the time, only occasionally being interrupted by a question from one of my grandparents. The endless miles of open fields around us were a welcome change. I'd rack my brain attempting to identify the birds that flew by, or the trees that lined the fence lines. The next couple of days were normal. I decided to stay back at home while everyone did their last minute shopping. I figured that I'd be more likely to get things I wanted if I wasn't sticking around close to them. On Christmas Eve, we all got together around the tree and exchanged our gifts. It was a run-of-the-mill event. I opened my grandparents' packages and pretended I was overwhelmed by receiving the exact same socks and sweater I got last year. Now, I know that sounds ungrateful, but let's be honest here. When you're at that age, the last thing you wanted was an assortment of undergarments. The next morning was what I couldn't wait for. My heart had been set on a bike for the last few years. I'd even shown my parents the exact model I wanted and everything. As my birthday had approached, they dropped hint after hint, but by the time it arrived, it never materialized. I was hyped up beyond belief, and my folks had seen the clear disappointment on my face when I realized I would not be getting it. I barely slept that night. The second the sun broke through the blinds, I was out of bed and down the stairs. My folks were already sitting at the table waiting for me to arrive. I turned the corner so fast, I almost missed it. Sitting right there in the middle of the den was a brand new mountain bike but not just any mountain bike either. It was the exact specialized one I'd been ranting and raving about for the last two years. I was so focused on the bike that I didn't even notice the other boxes under the tree. My mom had to point them out to me. Rather than spend any more time away from my beautiful bike, I ran over, snatched the boxes, and brought them right back to the center of the den. I wasn't expecting much else, maybe some clothes or something, but to my utter amazement there was a MacBook along with a set of studio monitors. This was like three Christmases wrapped up in one. I knew my parents had felt bad about not getting the bike on my birthday and decided to spend a little extra this year to make up for it. I spent the remainder of the day alone, enjoying my amazing presence. The weather prevented me from riding too much, but I made the best of the time I did get. When it got too dark to ride, I set up my laptop, got online, and mocked those less fortunate than me. I slept in late the next day. It was just beginning to be afternoon when I came down for breakfast. I grabbed something small and helped my dad carry all the boxes to the curb. It looked like a Best Buy out there. Not only did I get the MacBook and monitors, but my mom had also bought my dad a 65-inch TV for the den. It was a great Christmas for everyone. 
at least until the robbery happened. We didn't know it at the time, but those boxes were like the bat signal for criminals. It was a painful learning experience, but one we'd never forget again. We'd all be tied up and gagged in less than an hour, just because of a pile of trash. It was around two in the afternoon. I was browsing the internet for cool things to pimp out my bike, when all of a sudden I heard a bunch of yelling in the kitchen. I came out and was met with a gun in my face. All I could see was the gun. I froze, and some guy I'd never seen before yelled at me to move. I was too scared, so he grabbed me by the arm and shoved me toward the den with everyone else. They were all grouped together, waiting to be told what to do next. My dad promised the prisoners that we'd do what we were told, and they were free to take whatever they wanted. We wouldn't resist. I guess they weren't going to take the risk, though. One guy held us at gunpoint, while two others bound our hands and blindfolded us with duct tape. That was when a voice told me to lie on my stomach. He didn't give me a chance to do it myself. I was pushed hard and fell forward. It knocked the wind out of me for a minute. Then they duct taped my mouth. It made it hard to gain my breath again. A few seconds later, I heard the same voice say to go. The noise of multiple footsteps shook the floor. I was too terrified to say anything. I just laid there and prayed it would go fast. The sound of the garage door opening got my attention. That was followed by the noise of what I guessed was some large truck. The knocking of the diesel engine was very distinctive. The next few minutes were just sounds of feet rushing through the house and out the garage. None of the men spoke, as far as I could tell. Probably no more than ten minutes passed by when I heard the garage door close, then complete silence. A minute went by and my dad asked if everyone was okay. I waited for a voice to tell him to shut up, but it never did. I was confident enough to begin struggling with the tape around my wrist. I twisted and pulled as hard as I could until the tape snapped. Dad was already free and undoing my grandfather's hands. I got the tape off my eyes while Dad finished getting everyone loose. I rushed over to my room. Everything had been taken. It felt like a knife in my gut. When I returned to the den, Dad was on the phone with 911. I was still in shock, but I remember Mom being especially upset. All I could do was sit on the couch and bury my face in my hands until the cops arrived. I kept my mouth shut and let the adults deal with anything. I was in no mood to talk anyway. I tossed and turned most of the night. I stayed in my room for the next few days, trying to get my mind off the robbery. I still had an old laptop because I'd packed it away under my bed. I guess the thieves had only taken everything they could see. The few times I did come out of the room, I noticed a shell-shocked look on everybody's face. I probably looked the same too. When it came time to take my grandparents to the airport, I just chose to stay home. My parents lost a lot of things, including both their engagement rings. As the weeks went by, the more important things were replaced, and we tried to move on with our lives. Updates about the case were few and far between. This group was obviously professional, without any names or visual identifications. They all wore masks and gloves. The chances of them getting caught were low. We did learn that they committed similar home invasions a few days later across town. It wasn't the objects we lost that made things so terrible, though. Despite losing a lot of expensive and sentimental objects, it was the feeling of violation that was the worst part, at least for me. Everyone in the house became a lot more security-focused after that. New, stronger locks and cameras were installed. I even put a lock on my bedroom and closet door and took to locking all my valuables in my closet any time I left the house. Most importantly, we never left our boxes out like that ever again. Over a year later, we were shocked to hear that a group with the exact same style of operation had been arrested during another home invasion. All but two of the men admitted to taking part in the robbery of our home. Of course, all our valuables had been sold long ago and were never to be recovered. 
The three who confessed took a plea deal and served years in prison. I have no clue what became of them after that. I was working late at the bank at 11 p.m. I was the last one inside. It was pitch black outdoors. The bank was essentially isolated, far away from anything nearby. Needless to say, I was very alone. I was walking around installing some new printers and making sure they were working, when all of a sudden, the security monitors in my IT room turned off. I went to go check the plugs to make sure that nothing had come loose. As I leaned over to inspect the cables, though, all the lights in the building died at once. I was plunged into darkness. My heart started racing from the shock. I could feel adrenaline building up in me. I reached into my pocket and grabbed out my phone to use as a light. Before I could get it out, though, the backup lights had already turned on. The whole building was now dimly lit by the faint green glow of the backup lights. The lights were fairly weak, but it was good enough to see a bit. I could make out objects in the room, though most things were still in shadows. I left my phone where it was. I decided to forget about the monitors and instead started walking toward the banking hall where all the tills were. That's because that's where the circuit breakers are. I guessed it was up to me to fix this. The bank was built like a bomb shelter, with thick concrete walls and multiple heavy lock metal doors. I have to swipe my ID card multiple times to get to the hall. I was scared that the power would go out again, and I'd end up locked in between two doors. I was quietly thinking about what I could do if such a thing happened. I was still a bit jumpy from the shock earlier. I looked over my shoulder and studied the shadows as I walked past them. And that's when I suddenly began to hear a blood-curdling scream. It was loud, long, and primal. I could almost feel it vibrating the air with how desperate it sounded. It was coming from the banking hall. I froze in place right before the final door, freaking out internally. I stared at the lock on that metal door as I listened to this scream. It seemed never-ending. It felt like the scream had been going on for three minutes or more without the person taking a breath at all. But I couldn't be sure. Adrenaline messes with your sense of time. I tried my best to control my breathing and checked behind me down the concrete corridor I came from. I decided I needed to press onward. I turned to the door to swipe my card and open it. I threw it open and burst through, ready for anything. I scanned half the room as I opened the door. Before I was blinded by a strong light, the scream had abruptly stopped earlier. I let my eyes adjust to see that the light was actually the main lights of the building reactivating. I was staring into this completely normal room in silence. It was terrifying. My heart was pounding in my chest. I could still hear the faint remembrance of the screams in my ears. The computers were all turned off and quiet. The bulletproof glass was all intact. The door at the front appeared to be locked and the screamer was gone. Whoever had been screaming was unaccounted for. I was quite freaked out at this point. I simply left out back the way I came in a panic and called it a night from then on. The scariest moment of my life happened while my friend and I were camping in eastern Canada. We were both teenagers. We decided to sleep in this abandoned camper we found deep in a large forest that was near our town. It had been there for so long that a grove of trees had grown around it. We stumbled across it while we were exploring a few months back and thought it would be cool and brave to sleep in it for one night. One weekend, we did exactly that. We arrived after dark because we had gotten lost trying to find the damn thing. We had some really low-power flashlights with us, so it made it even more difficult. 
Once we finally found it, we opened the rusty door and stepped inside. The sounds inside the camper were shrill and echoed. There were typical camper things strewn about. Empty cups, empty cans, old novels that were falling apart. Already tired, we holed up in one end of the camper, where the bed area must have originally been. That is, before the cushions had rotted away to almost nothing. A long hallway stretched the length of this camper, so we could basically see from end to end. In hindsight, this was not a good idea. It was a miserable night. There were several rats living in there. I saw them staring at us from a chewed out part of the ceiling. When the wind blew outside, the camper would shriek and groan. We even thought we heard a bear outside walking around. Still, we pretended to be brave and acted like we were having the best time. We were both on edge, though. At some point, I woke up from a deeply uncomfortable sleep. I sat up to adjust myself when I noticed movement out of the corner of my eye. At the other end of the camper was this small window. As I looked over to it, I began to make out what appeared to be a man's silhouette. He was staring straight at me from the outside. At first, I thought it was a weird shape of a small tree or something, but when I moved to get a better look, the person clearly reacted. My heart was pumping furiously. I woke up my friend immediately, saying someone was there over and over in a whisper. I couldn't take my eyes off the man outside. My friend woke up soon and nodded towards the window. He saw him too. We whispered frantically about who this could be so far out here and why he was staring in at us like this. No joke, for the next ten minutes he stared us down. The more we looked at him, the more frightened we got. Occasionally he would try to move, but would always keep his eyes locked right on us. Eventually I called out to him. Hey, do you need something? No reaction. My friend was braver than me. He decided to shine the flashlight at him. As soon as he did, the man ducked out of sight and disappeared. We quickly got up and packed our things and sprinted out into the dark woods. I looked behind me several times and thought I could see someone crawling around on the ground, but the man didn't try to follow us for long. I remember I was in Bermuda in the off-season with my mom, dad, and little brother. I must have been about five years old or so. It was before my other brother and sister were born. I remember the hotel was empty that day. The beach was empty as well. In fact, most of the place was quite empty. I don't recall ever seeing anyone else. I was on the beach with my parents and my little brother when I ran off to explore a bit. After a while of exploring, I looked up and saw what appeared to be my mom further ahead on the beach. She indicated to me to come over to her. There was a thicketed area of scrubby bushes and trees along that part of the beach. She went over to it and disappeared. There was this big cement square with pipes or vents or something coming out of it. I walked over to it and saw her standing there. As I approached, I started to get the feeling that something was wrong here. She motioned for me to continue coming towards her. I didn't want to be defiant to my mother, so I pretended I was really interested in these pipe-like things. Wow, I wonder what these are for, or something like that. As soon as I said that, she walked out of view and into one of them. My dad came up from behind me on the beach and yelled out, Hey, what are you doing? Don't wander off like that. He grabbed my hand and led me back to the area where my mother was sitting down in a chair. I still don't know who that was or why that woman looked so much like my mom, but clearly she was trying to do something bad. I worked at a campground on the night shift, 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. every night. It wasn't so bad, though. I would bring my PS2 and a good game. 
and game away a good portion of the night, only having to deal with one or two people on busy nights. It was just me in this little 8x8 eight eight shack, with nothing around but darkness. My first week there, the other guy who was quitting told me about this payphone a few feet away from the shack where I worked. He said it would ring every night at exactly 4.17 a.m. It would only ring once, probably just an automated test call, he guessed. He'd never answered it himself. I was working for a few months on that job since that point. He told me that in the middle of summer, so most nights I'd had the window closed. I'd never heard the payphone go off. In mid-August, I started leaving the windows open during the night, though, and sure enough, every night, at 4.17 a.m. on the dot, the phone would ring one time. The ring even sounded creepy with all the atmosphere around it. One night, I got up the nerve to answer that phone. I set an alarm for 4.15 and went to wait at the phone until it rang. When it did, I picked it up immediately, but there was no sound on the other end, just dead air like someone was on the other line, but wasn't saying anything. I said hello a few times, then hung up. I did this every night for a week, with the exact same results. I didn't think anything of it, and I started to leave it alone after a while. A while later, on the first week of October, I decided on a whim to answer the phone once again. I set my alarm, and when the time came, I answered it. Hello? Hello? I then heard what sounded like someone inhaling and exhaling through clenched teeth. The voice I heard was rough, and sounded like the person had gargled gravel. He said my name, my complete name, first, middle, and last. It was a voice I'd never heard before. I'll never forget how scared I was in that moment. I was so scared I slammed the phone on the receiver. I rattled some change into the payphone and hit star 69. The number had come from California, but I live in Indiana. I remember this happening to me back when I was a preteen. I think I was 12 at the time. And that was before we called people that age tweens. I've noticed lately that a lot of people seem to think that 11 and 12 year olds are just the face of innocence. But nothing could be further from the truth. Especially when I was that old. I knew that the boys were just as bad if not much worse than the men that were older than them. I really wasn't like all the other boys at that early of an age, although I do have to admit that I got that way later on. When I was 12 years old, I wasn't really interested in a lot of the things other boys would be interested in, though. More often than not, I really just wanted to be left to my own devices. Now, being left alone was not the best available option when I went to summer camp, though. I had taken no interest in going there, but my parents had insisted I do so. I had gone several times as a younger boy. I liked it much more when I was younger, but I felt I had since outgrown it, and I had no real interest in going back. Hey, I guess my parents thought they might need the extra time to themselves during the summer break, so I had to go even though I didn't want to. In my mind, it was a pain in the ass, really. Summer was supposed to be my time away from the stuff I had to put up with at school. Although I was a good student, I didn't like being around other kids at all. Most of the time, they really annoyed me. I wasn't bullied badly or anything like that. I just really didn't like many people. I just liked to be alone. The camp just seemed like a really lame way to spend part of my summer break. The only good thing was that the camp was far enough away from home and was attended by people from all over, so I would never run into anyone from my school while I was there. Most of the kids attending the camp were repeat attenders, so I knew plenty of them from year to year. My wanting to be alone was a pretty recent development. In the past, I was a lot more into the camping thing. All the counselors knew me, and there were plenty of other boys who were friends with me too, and hung out with me on previous years. 
Arriving this time, I could tell a lot of them had been looking forward to seeing me. I tried to be friendly and not be a jerk, but I just didn't feel like socializing with anyone. A little bit more than a week into the camp, I was not having the best time. I was having a hard time sleeping, too. I much preferred to be at home where there was air conditioning and I could read a book. Although I was not supposed to do so, I decided to get up and go for a walk. Fortunately, the counselor who slept in my cabin slept like a log, so I was able to get up and leave without him knowing any different. When I came back, I knew he would still be snoring his head off much like he was right then. God, it was so hot. I knew I wouldn't be getting sleep no matter how tired I was. I decided I was going to walk around endlessly until I'd exhausted my energy. I didn't pay much attention to where I was going either. I had been in these woods plenty of times before in my life, and even in the dark I had no fears of getting lost. I'm not sure how long I'd been out there when I started to hear a noise. I wasn't sure what it was, but it concerned me right away. It didn't sound human, and the last thing I needed was to encounter something non-human out there. Hell, I didn't really want to encounter something human this far out at night either. I was still young enough to believe those maniac in the woods with an axe stories they tell around the campfire. Thinking about these possible human and non-human fatal encounters really got me nervous. I didn't have any idea what that noise I kept hearing was. Something in my gut told me it was not good though. Since my imagination was beginning to get the better of me, I decided to try and head back ASAP. It's better to be unable to sleep while I'm in bed than to be walking around with who knows what coming after you. I'm not sure why I even thought this, but I stopped as I was hurrying back. I got the very distinct feeling that if I continued along this path, I would never make it back to camp. It was dark, but it wasn't too difficult to see since my eyes had been adjusting for a while. I found a tree that looked easy enough to climb and decided to go all the way up to the top. I thought I could get a better look around if I did so. It wasn't long before I'd climbed up the tree. I was very grateful. I could see something walking around really close, hiding in the darkness. I had to squint my eyes a little to try to make it out better, but when I did... I was pretty shocked by what I saw. There was a large wolf roaming around. I thought to myself that wolf must have been the noise I was hearing. I didn't know what to do. I knew very little about wild wolves. All I did know was what they told us at camp. I didn't know if wolves ate humans or if they could climb trees or what. I decided that despite the fact I was really scared, I needed to stay as quiet as I could. I knew there was not only one wolf out there, there must have been a pack doing some night hunting. The wolf came and went as I remained in the tree, however it was never out of sight for long, it kept coming back over and over. There was no point at which I felt I could climb down and safely make it back to camp. It got very difficult at times, holding myself up against the tree, but I knew I had to do so. I was hiding up there for a very long time. At no point was I ever sure whether or not the wolf even knew I was there, but he kept coming back no matter what, so he must have. After a while, I found myself getting very, very sleepy, but the worst thing that could happen to me was to fall asleep in this situation and fall out of that damn tree. After several more minutes passed by, I realized I'd not seen the wolf come back for a while after the last time he'd gone out of view. It seemed like it might be a good time to get down and make a break for the camp. I was still terrified the wolf would come back and eat me though. I stayed up in the tree all night, waiting to see if the wolf was skulking around and waiting to come back or not. Eventually the sun came up and the wolf was nowhere to be seen. It wasn't until then, when I was able to see better around me, that I tried to climb down and make it back to camp. Even then, I was still terrified. My brain was tired from not getting any sleep at all, and I wasn't fully in charge of my faculties. I was jumping at every noise, thinking his pack was coming after me. I made it back to camp before everyone woke up. 
I was able to crawl into bed and pretend I had been there all night long. I pretended to be sick that day in order to remain in bed and get some sleep. That was the last time I ever wandered into the woods in the middle of the night. My grandma lived in this big house out in the country. I always loved visiting there when I was younger because it was a much different atmosphere than what I was used to. Although it definitely didn't compare to the country houses the very rich have, it was still a really big and nice house. I often wondered how my grandma lived in such a big place by herself. She had been there as long as I knew, and she seemed really happy to be out there. I can't explain a whole lot about the house. I'm just really not that descriptive of a writer, but just know that it did not have air conditioning in it. It actually didn't really need it though. During the summertime, my grandma would just keep all the windows open in the house. On almost any day, the breeze would carry throughout the whole place, keeping it pretty cool all in all. It was nearly as good and sometimes even better than air conditioning. The house had three stories, which didn't include the attic and the fruit cellar. There were tons of bedrooms as well, so when relatives came to visit, there was always room. There were rooms that I had never been in before too. I'll always remember and love that huge house. There was one summer though when I didn't exactly have the best time there. I was pretty young at the time, but I can't tell you exactly how young. I was young enough to remember having an active imagination, which I realized could have an effect on how I perceived things. Being out in the country and being in that big house could really open up your mind to many possibilities, especially when you were a kid. This summer, I was spending a week at my grandma's house by myself. I always liked sleeping in this certain room on the second floor. I rarely ever went up to the third floor of the house, but out of a lack of much else to do, I did go exploring in that area during this week. I even went up into the attic and looked around in there. There wasn't really much interesting, just a bunch of boxes and storage. It was very strange and creepy up in the attic though, and that itself put me into a bit of an imaginative mood. I don't know if it's related, but I mention my exploring because the thing that happened to me just so happened to occur the very same night of that day when I went to explore those new parts of the house. I was in bed trying to go to sleep in the room I always slept in. The window was open and the door was propped open as well. It was a nice cool breeze going through the house. The wind was a little bit loud on this night, so when I first heard something, I barely heard it. It sounded like someone was groaning outside. At first, I chalked it up to the wind and tried to leave it to that. However, I could still hear it even as time went on. As the noise continued to come in through the window, each time it seemed less and less like the wind. I finally knew that it couldn't be the wind at all because I heard someone distinctly moaning for help. No one lived close to Grandma's house, so it couldn't have been a neighbor. There was also no reason for anyone to be in our yard. They would have to be, though, in order for me to have heard them. It was the second time I heard them distinctly call for help that I decided to go over to the window and see what was going on. Of course, I was nervous. I was downright scared, if I'm being honest. I crept over to the window keeping myself hidden so whoever might be out there couldn't see me. When I got there, I peered over the edge and didn't see anything at first. I could hear the person still calling out for help, though. I tried to locate where this voice was coming from. It was difficult to do so and keep myself hidden from view at the same time. However, I did manage to do it. It was very dark outside. I couldn't see anyone in the yard, much less someone that was in need of help. I waited by the window just watching. I waited for someone to yell for help again, but I didn't hear them do it. I was ready to chalk it all up to my imagination and just go back to bed, but then I saw something that shocked me. 
I noticed a person, appearing completely able-bodied, briefly popping up from behind a tree. He looked up in my direction, probably didn't see me there, and hid himself behind the tree once more. He then began to groan and call out for help again. I moved back from the window and went to the room of my grandma to wake her up and tell her what I had seen. I thought the man out there must have been up to something, and something not very good. My grandma did something I'll never forget to this day. She grabbed up her rifle and rushed out the front door of the house. She opened the door and began to fire the rifle into the air. There's another one for you if you don't get the hell off my property. I wasn't in the room, but I bet if I had been, I would have seen that guy running away after grandma fired that shot. I slept in my grandma's room that night because I was still pretty shaken up about the whole thing. My grandma was a hunter, and I knew she was really good with her rifle, so I felt well protected. Later, she told me she saw the guy running off into the woods. I wish I had seen him running from my grandma, too. There was this guy in high school that was really funny, pretty popular, and that almost everyone got along with. He didn't bully anyone that I can recall, and it was impossible to not laugh when he was around. He was a genuinely goofy guy, the real class clown type. He would say hi to me, try to strike up a conversation, and even compliment me every now and then. Being an awkward teenage girl in an extremely cringe-worthy emo phase, I was quite flattered. I wasn't used to getting attention like that. So it was nice to have this guy around the school that would just randomly say, Hey, you look real nice today. I wasn't interested in him romantically or anything. He was more of a funny acquaintance that made me smile every once in a while. He added me on Facebook eventually, like he did with almost all the kids in his grade, and the grade below his. After a while, he asked me if I wanted to hang out with him after school. I contemplated it, but there was a faint voice in the back of my head saying it was not a good idea. No red alarms were going off, but something in my gut was telling me to be wary of this guy. I never took him up on his offer, even if other people would be around. He would also ask my best friend to hang out after school too, but she never accepted either. We would often talk about how weird it was that he would ask us separately to hang out with him after school, especially since we weren't the type of girls he was known to like. We both agreed it was kind of weird and we would really rather not do that. Time passed, life went on, and I completely forgot about that guy. Until about a week ago, when one of my friends shared an article about a bar in the next town over. It was under scrutiny for supposedly aiding predators who hunted there, or something to that effect. I can't remember exactly what the article said, because I was more focused on another detail mentioned. That guy I went to school with? He was caught ripping many women, and that bar was his hunting ground. Word around my hometown is that those weren't his only victims, and that he'd started even earlier in life. This was about a year and a half ago. I had just had a farewell party with my best friend and went to bus home. It was around 1.30 in the morning. I got off the bus and walked through the Walgreens parking lot. Someone pulled in behind me and kind of sidled next to me before parking. I kept on walking. About a block away, I hear a loud pop. I look back and the guy is still in his car with the lights on. I keep going. When I'd reached a block away from my house, I had to cross the street. When I did, the car came down the street out of nowhere and screeched to an abrupt halt right next to me on the sidewalk. At this point, I was shitting my pants just about. The man tried to say something to me that I couldn't quite make out. I sternly said no and began to walk away. I had a choice here. I could walk all the way around the block to the front of the house or cut through the alleyway and reach my home much faster. 
I briskly ran into the alleyway, hoping he'd leave me alone. He pulled in behind me, and I heard the car door open. I started running even faster, as fast as I ever had in my whole life. I reached my driveway in about 10 seconds. I immediately burst into the house, screaming that someone had just tried to take me. I bought pepper spray and a knife the next day.